Good evening. I'm Karen Tucker, CEO at the Churchill Club. Welcome. We're honored to present Steve Van Roekel, new CIO of the United States, in his first public appearance since President Obama appointed him in the role last August. Steve, thank you for being here and welcome. We're happy that you chose the innovation community here in Silicon Valley for your first public meeting, and we know you're one of us, so I'd also like to say welcome home. Thank you very much to our co-hosts, Tech America, TechNet, and Park for your partnership. Our program tonight will be presented in two parts. First, Steve will speak with us directly about his vision and his priorities as federal CIO. And he will then be joined in conversation by George Anders, founding member of the Bloomberg View Board of Editors and author of the new book, The Rare Find. If you are tweeting tonight, please use the hashtag Churchill Club. And let me now invite Daniel Veroni, the distinguished acting president and CEO of the largest U.S. tech trade association, Tech America, to introduce our guest of honor. Please welcome Dan Veroni. Thank you, Karen. It's a pleasure to be here and be part of the Churchill Club event this evening. Um, we're especially thrilled to welcome Steve Van Roekel this evening to the Churchill Club right here in the heart of Silicon Valley. He's certainly not a stranger here at all. It's the home of American innovation, and he's not a stranger to the seat of policy in Washington, D.C. The unparalleled fiscal challenges facing our nation require new and innovating thinking to surmount them. This type of thinking stems from an understanding of how a partnership between private sector and government can be the answer to many challenges, especially in the realm of technology. And this is exactly what Steve brings to the table as he directs federal IT policy and critical spending of federal IT dollars. His 15 years of experience in the technology industry plays a critical role in understanding how investing in the right way can result in both cost savings for the government as well as better service to taxpayers. Combined with his excellent experience in the federal government, Steve has the unique perspective to institute change that delivers transparency, innovation, and cost savings, a critical step forward. The Obama administration has shown its commitment to modernizing government first by creating the position of chief information officer and now by appointing Steve Van Roekel. Please help me welcome Steve Van Roekel. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Dan obviously did not get the no tie memo that I had uh, sent out, uh, seizing the opportunity of coming to the West Coast uh, uh, here. Uh, thank you, Dan and Tech America for, uh, for uh, helping host tonight. Karen and the Churchill Club, thank you very much for, uh, for hosting. Uh, TechNet uh, for your involvement as well. And um, I also want to thank uh, my CIO colleagues, some, some of which are here um, in the front row on either side uh, and, uh, and are watching on the, uh, on the webcast as well. I, all the inspiration we drive in the federal government and the CI in the uh, IT space couldn't be realized without the, the hard work that the, uh, the CIOs and the, the IT uh, people uh, overseeing the 2.65 million end users uh, on the civilian side of the federal government uh, uh, every single day. So it's, a, it's an incredible, uh, incredible time there. Uh, I also want to thank Park for hosting uh, the evening tonight. It's a, it's a, I don't know about you guys, but growing up uh, in, the, uh, in the 80s and getting my hands on some early technology in, in those days, it's, it's truly humbling to be here at, at the nexus of innovation and American technology and, and so many other things. I mean, Park has literally changed lives and it uh, definitely changed mine and I'll, I'll give you an example of that in, in a second. Um, I suspect that there's probably even original versions of Park technology maybe running inside the federal government right now. So. <laughs> I didn't see the three button mouse on the president's desk, but it might be there somewhere. Um, as the president said in his last State of the Union, what America does better than anyone else is spark the creativity and imagination of our people. Um, innovation, uh, like those happening here at Park uh, and throughout the valley and around this country, 
um, have been a driving force in, in our history and uh, the way we do work, the way we enjoy life, uh, the way we interact with others. Um, and the government's actually played a nice role in, in igniting that spark. Um, if you look at a lot of the, the fundamental research uh, that happened in the, in the 60s and 70s um, and up to today, you know, DARPA and the internet, um, ethernet, you know, design down the hall from where you're sitting right now um, to, to the National Institute of Health and the Human Genome Project. You know, we're unlocking amazing uh, uh, innovations and technologies uh, in everything we do, and government needs to play a role in reducing barriers um, to growth and investment. You know, a lot of the, what you hear today uh, in, in the press and other places is that America is losing its ability to innovate that we've, uh, we can't compete and our best days are behind us. Uh, we've heard that story before, you know, in the, in the 1980s. Uh, I remember growing up uh, in, a, in a world where America was destined to be a services economy. All the innovation was happening in other places. You know, we were, we were gonna be the world of, of people who flipped burgers for a living and, and gave advice and um, I remember, uh, you know, seeing videos on television of, of innovations coming out of Japan, for example. Um, I remember seeing videos of uh, Japanese business people doing workouts before work and how that service mentality would, would drive certain behaviors. Um, but fundamental research, as I mentioned before, private-public partnerships and great ideas like those coming out of here and, and out of garages around this country and, and other places uh, really sparked the technology revolution uh, and reestablished our leadership in, in, uh, in launching what became an innovation economy across the world. And we're, uh, we have an opportunity to, to seize on that and that phenomenon in the mid 80s as I was growing up and coding my first basic programs and all that had a big impact on me. Um, my mom asked me did I put these pictures in, like my first public <laughs> experience. There I am opening my very first Commodore 64, my first computer. <laughs> and look at those nice camouflage pants I'm wearing. I'm sort of halfway to government right there. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, pretty, about five minutes after these pictures were taken, I was in my bedroom coding and didn't come out, you know, until a, about a week later or so. Um, but as it did then, you know, in the 1980s um, and before, and a lot of the stuff that, that came out of here, um, America's future depends on our ability to innovate, to drive new technology, to drive that next wave of, of, uh, of end user benefit, to you know, revolutionize the way we do business, change the business models and everything else. But that couldn't be more true, of the necessity of that opportunity in the federal government. Uh, you know, coming from the private sector into government, what's really interesting is that the challenges and opportunities are more similar than you'd think. Uh, you know, walking around uh, uh, the, the federal landscape, the scale is sh surely daunting. I mentioned the 2.65 million uh, end users on the civilian side. The U.S. government spends about $80 billion a year on information technology. Uh, but the, the, the challenges are the same, even at that grand scale. You break it down into the agency level. They're like large corporations. Uh, but the words are a little different. You know, in the context of government, when you say shareholders on the private sector, it means citizens in the government context. When you say business objective, it really means mission. What's the mission of the agency? When you talk about competitors, our job in the federal government is to, to provide global competitiveness, create opportunities for jobs, create opportunities for, uh, uh, for us to out-innovate, to, uh, to out-educate, and, and out-compete the rest of the world through American business. Um, but there's some that actually have said that, you know, now isn't the time to invest in government IT. That it's you know, just viewed as a, as a discretionary line item on the, on the budget and you should cut it back because it's just another cost uh, that, that burdens government. Um, but if anyone doubts that now is the time to invest, an interesting fact is um, more than half of the Fortune 500 companies founded uh, in the world were founded in the worst economic times. Uh, in our history. My alma mater at Microsoft was actually founded in 1975 during a, a pretty large recession. And I think that that opportunity speaks to a few things. One is access to people. 
that in an in a economic downturn, you have access to smart people that are looking for their next big thing. But if you trace a lot of these companies back and look at the opportunity, oftentimes it was technology that was available at those inflection points that jettisoned certain companies forward. If you look at the recent social media uh, revolution inside, inside the US, I think that's an example of, of uh, where we're moving forward now. The green opportunity to, to move uh, green technology forward and all of that. Uh, the other phenomenon that's happening during this time is that we have amazing tools are at our disposal. Technology is now available that lets us do new things very differently than we did in the past. You know, the normal course of action for many companies, and I'm sure you all represent many of those, and, and, uh, and people was to really, you know, set single servers up with single workloads on them and kind of scale that out, build lots of data centers and, and get those things. Uh, never before we have we had the technology and the intersection of, of cloud and virtualization and hardware capabilities um, uh, to come to bear on these opportunities we have. The opportunity here is really to do more with less, to get more out of our investments by, by using fewer resources and, and drive that across the broad footprint that is government. Many of you in private sector have done this. You've, you've consolidated, you view IT as a strategic resource and you've gone and, and driven that, uh, that phenomenon forward. So my first job and, and priority in this role um, and the president's called on me as chief information officer to do many things, but the first one is to maximize ROI in the federal footprint. Um, it includes things uh, like closing and optimizing our data centers. We have over, uh, over 2,800 data centers uh, in the federal footprint. Uh, ranges from a, about 100 square feet to you know, 500 and more square feet um, across this. Uh, by 2015, we plan to close nearly 1,000 of those. Uh, which will yield amazing savings uh, in, the, in, the, in the network, in the uh, neighborhood of five to six billion dollars uh, by closing those. We're going to shift to cloud and commodity IT where it makes sense. Uh, our cloud first policy is, is one that I'm a, a big believer in for many reasons. Uh, in large part, it's not only gives us ancillary benefits of, of moving to new technology, getting scale efficiency of, of sharing cloud technology, but also uh, allowing us to shift the way we spend our federal dollars, moving from a kind of a capital intensive model of spending on servers every few years to an operating expense model that uh, lets us spread the, spread the cost over, uh, over a lot of time. And that's a, that's a model that's ex much more acceptable and pal palatable in the, uh, in the government model. Uh, we have the, the president's campaign to cut waste. Uh, that's a broad campaign that we're not only looking into IT on how to drive cost savings into uh, our information spend and information technology, but also looking at things like when we close a data center, how do we reclaim real estate? How are we maximizing our green efficiencies of our, of our systems? Uh, how are we getting uh, duplication rooted out across, across all this area? Um, and, uh, and it follows with the notion of something that, uh, that I'm going to drive in government, which will be a shared first policy. Uh, this shared first policy is one where we will work with agencies to share first. It's very likely that many things that you want to acquire in the federal government has been acquired before. It's been, a, it's been run through the procurement process that often takes months at a time. Uh, to drive a pace of innovation that we want to drive in government, we will go out and share. We'll share procurement, we'll share technology, we'll share expertise, and we'll share uh, systems both inside agencies and across agencies to drive greater efficiencies. A great example of this is the, is the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, it grew up like any other organization and, and in, the, uh, in the context of government, grew up in such a way that they, uh, they developed 21 different email systems across USDA. Uh, the Secretary of Agriculture couldn't even send a mail to all the employees of USDA without someone on IT copying and pasting and kind of bridging across these systems. Uh, this, uh, you know, led to massive inefficiencies, about $24 per month per mailbox across their entire footprint. They decided, USDA decided to take the bold step to, to consolidate, to go to one email system across, this, uh, across their, their landscape. They went to a cloud provider, went to one system. Their $24 a month per mailbox went down to $8 per month per mailbox. So a third the cost. With the move to cloud, 
they, they got collaboration tools, they got the ability to share documents in a, in a much deeper way, and they got the ability to email everyone inside the organization, which is, which is even better. Uh, so Shared First is, I'm very excited about Shared First and working with my, my counterparts in procurement, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Congress, in the agencies to really drive this ability to share. If we share things first and take the mentality that when we go out with things we're sharing first, I think we'll have a very transformative effect, not only in the cost structure, but the pace of implementation. The fact that someone's procured it before, I can point at it and procure it again at a much faster pace than I could uh, with stuff that, uh, that I have to run through uh, a long cycle. Another initiative for me is addressing the productivity gap of government. You know, it's, it's hard to measure productivity in the federal government. We don't have a stock price. Uh, generally, from an agency standpoint, we don't have widgets that we output, we don't have product that we develop. Uh, but, but we do have certain cases where we can measure. Patent and Trademark Office has throughput of patent applications. The uh, Veterans Administration has uh, claims to, to, uh, to, to monitor on how fast are we getting veterans' benefits out and what's the backlog and how fast are, is our throughput there. But the thing we'll really lean on in, in the productivity gap is to really understand what are best practices that have happened in the private sector and how can we apply well-studied uh, uh, productivity gains in the private sector to drive those into uh, the public sector. Um, we fell behind in really making smart investments in this area. You know, the fact that BlackBerry has been the mobile strategy for the federal government in the last 12 to 15 years is, is really, not that BlackBerry's bad, I really like my BlackBerry, uh, uh, but it, it's, uh, it's not, we're at an inflection point where we need to seize on the app opportunity, the mobile opportunity, but it also falls under the context of do more with less. I mean, if you went out tomorrow in our tough fiscal environment, you saw every federal employee carrying a tablet device, you'd probably scratch your head and say, do we need every federal employee to have a tablet device? But if I went out with every federal employee with a tablet device and I said I'm closing uh, field offices and I'm consolidating and we're driving efficiencies in a way, we're getting more cars off the road through telework, we're doing other things, everything we do will be do more with less to, to cut in areas and invest that in making uh, better service for the American people and, uh, and better uh, productivity as a, as a part of that element. The third area, ROI, productivity, and now re redefining the engagement with government. You know, we have an opportunity uh, with web technologies, app technologies, data technologies to really redefine the way citizens interact with their government. The fact that a, if you're a small business and you want to export a product in this country, there's about seven agencies of government you have to work with to get that done is just a broken model. You know, for too long we've had a, had a very out, inside looking out perspective versus an outside looking in. And the, the president and my pre predecessor have driven a lot of, a lot of initiatives on this front. Uh, we, we launched an effort to reduce the number of .gov domains in the, uh, in the federal footprint. We have about 1,700 of them uh, right now. Uh, about five of, 500 of them or so are actually used a lot by, by citizens. Um, and so we're going to call that back to really understand what are centers of gravity, how do we have that outside looking in perspective in government. Uh, we're going to shift to uh, uh, and deliver on a few promises to business. Uh, one of those is a a one-stop portal that we're creating to, called Business USA that allows business to have one place to go to get information on exporting, on information about government that will entail a lot, of, uh, a lot of technology that pulls from different agencies and brings it together. Uh, but we'll also have a no wrong door policy. So if you show up in an SBA office in a, in, a, in a local community, you show up on a website or you show up through an agency, we're going to co-brand everything so you understand that you're part of a, it's part of a bigger picture and you can find the information that you need. Uh, we're launching a, uh, very soon we're launching a permitting dashboard. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure permits in, uh, that involve things like environmental reviews that tend to, to, tend to be blockers for people getting uh, jobs created to, to build out infrastructure in this country. Uh, and so we are creating a, a, a portal to shine light on that to make sure that we prioritize certain uh, permitting and, and infrastructure projects and allow people in the public to comment, understand, see who's accountable on steps and, and really kind of force a, a set of behaviors to, uh, to push the envelope on that stuff. 
the other thing we're doing is really, uh, you know, and I did a lot of this in, in my time at the Federal Communications Commission, is, is really kind of meeting the commitment on uh, open government uh, and, and really driving open government and, uh, and open data and other things across the, the federal landscape. Uh, the president reaffirmed, uh, you know, this commitment in September with the, um, the National Open Government Action Plan that we launched the United Nations. I was part of that, and we, we, we made a commitment to do things like evolve data.gov to be more interactive, to work on a, on a way that we can actually share data.gov code worldwide and, and, uh, and uh, make sure that we can kind of promote that, that sense of uh, democracy through data around the world. And, uh, I'm great to see, I'm, I'm very happy to see this level of open, openness, not only on kind of core government data that I think private sector people can use, but also creating mechanisms by which we can shine lights on, on IT spending, government spending generally, and a great accountability across all that. Another big area is, is of course, cybersecurity. All these elements that I just mentioned are really grounded on a foundation that is cybersecurity being part of everything that we do. The, the general problem with cybersecurity is a lot of times people will use cybersecurity as an excuse to not move forward on, on innovating, not move forward on platforms, not shift to the cloud and get that. And I think, I think we, you know, making that distinction between cyber as that blanket excuse, excuse um, really makes a false choice between security and innovation. I think security and innovation should dovetail into an opportunity. Uh, we have an opportunity when you move to cloud, when you build a new system, when you deploy something new to bolster our, uh, our not only our innovation, but our cybersecurity footprint. Um, you know, everything nowadays are, is connected. A data center you have on premise is as connected as a, as a cloud provider. And we need to really bolster the footprint of, of uh, cybersecurity and be ever vigilant on our, uh, on our existing infrastructure and the investments we have there um, to really evolve, uh, evolve security and, and to move forward on that. The last thing I'll mention is, is talking about the way we invest. You know, when I go to Congress and I talk about sort of the three priority, priority areas of ROI, uh, productivity, citizen and business interaction with government sort of grounded on the cybersecurity, uh, I would miss a point if I didn't also have the conversation about the way we build technology and the way we spend. Uh, you know, for, for many, many years, uh, there's been a lot of great people in front of congressional appropriators and others asking for money to go spend on IT, and sometimes, that didn't yield the best results. Uh, some parts of that is the way we build, parts of it is the way we appropriate, the way we do other things. And so a lot of my priorities are going to be around really pushing the envelope on the way we build and the way we invest in government. Um, I'll give you a, a quick example here in sort of graphics. So a lot of projects in government tend to follow a very, very standard path. And they, they tend to be one where you come in and spec and build a very big monolithic project. An exam example of this was, was one called the Defense Integrated Military Human Resource System. Uh, uh, DIMHERS was the, the acronym. That's <laughs> awesome. Uh, it was scoped for seven years of development to build this you know, Department of Defense integrated uh, HR system. Uh, after 10 years in 2010, so you know when this when we came forward in this administration, we're kind of picking up the end of this. Uh, they have they had spent 850 million dollars on this project, um, and Secretary Gates basically said in 2010 when we came in as an administration and, and killed this project because it was going nowhere. Uh, he said it, it basically only yielded an unpronounceable acronym was what he spent 850 million dollars on. And if you look at uh, you know, things like this, you, you tend to have two phenomenons. One is by the time you reach a certain time threshold, what you're working on is obsolete. You can imagine 10 years ago, technology brought to bear on something that you're spending 10 years on will not be set up in a modern way. So you reach a certain time threshold where the thing is just obsolete. And then we always reach this threshold where it sort of fails. And it fails for a few points. One, sometimes we finish the project. But business requirements, technology requirements, government requirements always change. The ability to go back and make changes in these big monolithic systems are, are nearly impossible. 
uh, it often is, is less expensive to just throw the thing away and reinvent it from the ground up. Uh, but if we just reinvent it in the monolithic model, um, it won't work. And so what I'm proposing for government is a, is a new model, uh, one that we drive uh, a few things to, to, uh, to achieve, um, and that is basically investing in, in modular design. Um, and the way we'll, we'll do that is, is through a, a process that I'm calling Future First. Um, I'm gonna, this is, tonight is the kickoff of Future First. Uh, this is where I, w I expect all of you to, to step up on behalf of your country to help us understand what should be in Future First. You know, I, I ask the question, should it be XML first? Should we, should we uh, you know, require that all data created by government is schematized and machine readable? I don't know if XML is the right one, because XML is ever evolving as well, but understanding that. Uh, should it be web services first, that all interfaces should be built on open web services? Uh, should we do agile development first? Should we require that any IT project in government be broken into a piece that can be developed in, say, 90 days and, and deliver value in that, that time? Should it be virtualized first? Probably so. And, and we drive virtualization across these things. Parts, part of the tenets of this, besides the technology, which is the first part that I discussed there, are two other key elements, I think, to getting a future ready first or a future first out there. So technology is one piece of the puzzle. The second one's policy, and I'll drive that um, to drive the policy across the government to do this. And then I think the third is people, um, getting a new set of people to, to supplement the great people we have in government to get this stuff done. And part of that is, one, driving a behavior of lean startup in government, you know, creating tiger teams to go spec, drive, and design um, uh, these, uh, these projects and to do it in a way that's going to do tangible results within fiscal years and, and get forward. Another one is creating a new talent pool. Uh, I announced about a month ago something called the Presidential Technology Fellows. This is a rigorous uh, funneling process where uh, college undergrads and graduate students can apply to be a member of the Technology Fellows that uh, once they're through the other end of the process and come out the, the vetting uh, that's created here, that will create a pool of talent by which we can, in the agency level, just point at and hire. We don't have to run them through a, through a hiring process. You can just point at a person and say, I want that person. They're an expert in this. I'm going to bring them in. I'm going to run them in Lean Startup, and I'm going get to that, get that going uh, forward. Uh, the third one is something we're already piloting. We're piloting this at the, the Food and Drug Administration and uh, 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 the Health and Human Services uh, Department, and that's entrepreneurs and residents, something that's not foreign to the, to the, to the community here uh, in town, but something that is foreign to the federal government. And this is where we bring in experts like all of you and, and others to, to drive, to run these teams, to drive these phenomena, to, to do this agile development in a way that can do these tangible results. And so I hope you all, uh, all help us on this front and step up. We set up an email account first. This will turn into a crowdsourcing platform uh, eventually, but it's futurefirst at cio.gov um, with twi Twitter handle futurefirst. Use this one and Churchill. Uh, <laughs> Churchill when, when, you, uh, when you go up there. But I'd love it to start a dialogue on this. What, sh what should be included? What shouldn't be included? Um, the things I want to avoid are you know, locking vendor, you know, specific solutions that, that favor specific vendor, uh, I want to avoid stuff that, that can evolve. Future first will not be locked in stone. It will ever evolve, but it should be based on principles by which we, we build extensibility and future readiness and modularity and the ability to deliver in, fisc, uh, in, in uh, fixed fiscal year timeframes and, and all of that. So I'm very excited about this, and I, I hope you all, uh, you all help and, and network with your, uh, your communities to, to help step up on this as well. So. The last point I make is the, the beauty of innovation is that it is an endless resource, unlike many things in our lives and, and everything else. Throughout, throughout American history, we draw on that resource you know, when, when we're in times of need. I think initiatives like Future First, the modularity, the technology that exists, the people we have in the pipeline in an economic downturn to, to bring to bear on the federal landscape and, and, the, and the private sector, um, that opportunity has never been greater to seize and to drive forward a new phenomenon. And the great thing about this is we're all Americans. Uh, doing hard work here, helping define what happens in the government, 
will not only lift in this ship that is the federal government and make us run better, but it will lift all you up as well. So I'm excited to get started, and uh, thank you all for coming and hosting me tonight. Too. So. your fleet stream, by the way. Oh, yeah. 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 It's, it's amazing what you can data mine out of that. Yeah. So we'll have some fun there. <laughs> My personal one? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Oh, I got six pages of your tweets. But oh, good. So, yeah. <laughs> this concludes the evening. <laughs> okay. Are, are we ready to start the, the Q&A? Sorry, yeah. Um, will you be putting the copy of that presentation where we discussed it? Uh, I will put it up on uh, cio.gov. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we'll start simple, and then we'll, we'll ratchet up. Uh, you've got 80 billion to spend. Talk a little bit about what you're buying, and particularly what you're buying that you weren't a few years ago, and what direction you're going. That is a simple question. What we're buying across an 80 billion dollar portfolio. Yes. Uh, I think we buy everything in 80 billion dollars. It, it, uh, I personally buy nothing. Um, I, uh, uh, part, you know, my job is to set policy uh, and, and, and kind of strike the strike the great balance between inspire and push. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of set a direction and, and, and push. You know, the, the, I view a big part of my job is protecting, you know, innovators and innovations in this country. And part of that is creating a vibrant marketplace by me not personally getting involved in procurement and allowing the, the mm -hmm. agencies to make those decisions. You know, the great thing about, you know, being a CIO at the agency level is that, uh, you know, you really are the universe. You're the babble fish between kind of the mission of the agency and the technology. And have to build that translation. And so the as requirements change, as they evolve, I think the way we build, as I mentioned, and, mm -hmm. and all that needs to change, and we'll be investing in, in things like that. Um, and uh, and uh, so that, that evolution's happening, but I, uh, you know, we'll. Uh, but your future uh, Hearst agenda is bold, and you're really trying to redefine some big elements of the procurement process of sort of it's, it's more how we do it as opposed to who brought in the most interesting demo, and can we get one of those? Yeah, I think it's, you know, Pushing for a modular, lightweight ability to, to, to engineer within a year and deliver on this promise, I think that is a, it's a core element of where we need to evolve. You know, it, there are small examples of that in government that it, where it's worked well, um, but largely we're going to rest on understanding that the other model doesn't work. And mm -hmm. so we have to go to a, a model that accommodates the requirements that, or the, the requirements that are, are, are sort of forced on us by the process. Mm -hmm. You know, the way that Congress uh, allocates money in single fiscal years, and we're I'm discussing with Congress how to maybe do multi-year IT funding, which I think would be a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, the way that, that uh, budget often, you know, when I was in the private sector on sort of the second day of the fiscal year, the money would be available to you, and surely you had to make sort of end of quarter adjustments based on you know, stock price and things like that. But largely, you had a good predictability on what your what your allocations are going to be. The federal government, we're almost a month into fiscal year 2012, starts mm -hmm. at the beginning of October, um, and we have no we have no budget. We're we're operating on this sort of what's called a continuing resolution, and and uh, we don't know what the money is going to end up looking like coming mm -hmm. out of the other end of that, and we don't know when we're going to get it. And mm -hmm. so, if you needed capital infusion to go drive some some phenomenon in government, it it uh, there's a lot of variability in it. So to do it in that model where you may get your money and have like four months left to spend on it, using this time to plan, to build these tiger teams, to kind of bring that, that, that small componentized modular architecture to bear is something you can get done in, in an agile way. And so that's a, that'll be, you know, as we spend and think about procurement and things, it'll be kind of breaking it down into these more componentized pieces, I think, will be mm -hmm. key to, to success. I was intrigued by your Tiger Team point because I think everyone who's dealt with big agencies, a lot of projects just go very slowly, and your obsolescence point comes true because they don't get built until they're near the end of their life cycle. Yeah. How many Tigers can you hire, and uh, how far along are you? Well, we had, uh, as an example, the, uh, the Presidential Technology Fellows Program. 
was a, uh, uh, it's, it's a, it's an adjunct to the Presidential Management Fellows Program. That pool had about 5,000 people that applied uh, into the pool to the top of the funnel. So we have, mm -hmm. we have a process to go through to get to the bottom of the funnel. Uh, but I'm very encouraged by that number as an example of, of kind of the talent we can draw from, I think, in this. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the Fortune 500 founding in the, in the Economic Times, I think it is a talent equation as well as a technology equation. And there is talent available to step up and, and help and, and uh, that we can call on to, to kind of come in and do this. Plus, you know, the other phenomenon we ended up seeing was, I think, you know, all of us who've written speeches or done speeches in the past, you know, 10 to 12 years, probably wrote the internet generation speech, or at least made it part of our speech, where we went mm -hmm. out and talked about this, this emerging group of people that have grown up online all their lives, and we're gonna sort of, they're gonna be the business leaders of tomorrow, and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the, and the government employees of tomorrow. Uh, they're all in their mid-20s right now, but what, I don't think what we hadn't anticipated was, was that uh, the emergence of sort of a Facebook nation, that we would have, we would have 80-year-old grandparents you know, embarrassing their grandchildren every day by posting on Facebook. Uh, but those people, because of that digital interaction, you know, computer in your pocket through smart devices, social media pulling you in, mm -hmm. expect more from their government. You know, mm -hmm. those people don't want to go to a social security website and fill out a, you know, print a form and fill it out and carry mm -hmm. it in. They want to they want to fill it out online and hit go, you know, and so things like that. Uh, Drug companies don't want to deliver boxes of documents to the FDA because there's a better right, way exactly. of getting applications in. Exactly. And so it's it's both on the citizen and business engagement will be things like streamlining systems. And if, mm -hmm. if we have a future first mentality and take, uh, you know, uh, an approach that says our data needs to be XML, our uh, interfaces need to be web services and things like that, that's not just a one-way, mm -hmm. you know, outgoing uh, type, type interaction. It needs to be a two-way. Mm -hmm. So business needs to be able to, you know, get, you know, data about what's going on with their, if they, if they pay taxes or fees or things mm -hmm. like that with the government and, and download information. We need to create an app economy around the, the broad set of government data mm -hmm. and, and do that. I did it at the FCC while I was there. I, I mandated that all data be XML, um, mm -hmm. schematized, and we defined that. Um, and we went, I went so far as to work with our legal team to actually start to get mm -hmm. that into regulations to drive uh, at the XMLing of data and the way we collected it from, it, it from businesses. And they, they loved it, right? Mm -hmm. Because it gave them a predictable way of providing government data versus if you go to the FCC headquarters and walk through the magnetometer, you'll see a filing window mm -hmm. where you normally would drop off your stack of paper and someone would scan it into a PDF or mm -hmm. something. And so, and so that interaction is, is very powerful. And then you take it a step further and say that everything needs to be web services from, a, from an interface standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, you can create a, a real, uh, level of innovation there that not only helps you when you create a new website to call on those web services or a mobile device mm -hmm. to call on those web services, but also, you know, create a business interaction that can do this. Uh, one of the things I shipped in, in uh, the FCC was broadbandmap.gov. Mm -hmm. has all the broadband capabilities across the entire United States and all the territories. Well, the first thing we did was we XML web services because that was the policy we mm -hmm. put forward. Um, and now what you're seeing is not only really interesting overlays of that data with education and healthcare and other things that other agencies are sort of piling on because it's really fascinating when you've got broadband capabilities, but I would encourage, you know, real estate websites and others to, to start to list broadband capabilities of homes. I don't, I don't know about you, but I, I care more, more about homes. broadband than I care about roof composition in a, mm -hmm. or, you know, things You'll like learn. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. want the good roof too. Well, my, my leaky roof, yeah. yeah. Uh, on that particular initiative, you had a lot of citizen participation. I think people ended up filling in some of the map on their own. What's what's the role you see for the general public working with data, helping you build stuff? Do you need to do it all yourself, or can you open the door, particularly if ROIs are returned? I think we can absolutely open the door, and we need it's a necessity of what we do. Um, it's uh, uh, yeah, broadband map. I had, it's sort of this interesting challenge in that um, you know the, the the data actually came through the states, so mm -hmm. the states actually called the data, so we had some data cleansing stuff we had to do, uh, but was largely provided by the vendors in those states that provided the broadband capability. So I didn't know if they were sort of telling the truth everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I'm gonna do some validation of this. We're gonna go out, and I, I sort of went down the normal, I was pretty new in the job, I, you know, I was maybe nine months to a year into the job at the FCC at that point, and, and decided I'm gonna go down the normal path to get information on 
on, uh, on this stuff, and I'll, I'll try to do procurement. So we, we went down, I worked with the contracting officers, and mm -hmm. we started to do procurement, and all these numbers started to come in on bids that were millions of dollars to go get data. And I had these dreams of putting devices in every postal truck that would drive around mm -hmm. and like pick up the data mm -hmm. for me and all these things, millions of dollars to do. And so we decided to you know, take a different approach. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we worked with some vendors to do some speed testing, built a mm -hmm. custom FCC instance uh, of, the, of their speed test app on the Android and iPhone platform and then built one online you can get to from your home connection. So we would get both the fixed and the wireless uh, validation. And then we, we had done a lot of work to get our social networks up, we had 400,000 mm -hmm. Twitter followers and, and, uh, and kind of started to really talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. We had about 2.5 million people download these apps and mm -hmm. run them multiple times. If you, any of you have an iPhone or an Android, go to their app store, you'll see it, it's still there. Um, and you will contribute to broadbandmap.gov by running around and taking tests in different areas. And, and these people ran them, you know, tens, 20 times mm -hmm. each and started to get amazing data coming into our map. It's now up there as a layer on broadband map and it's a web service. So if you want an app to call it and start to do, uh, anybody wants to do a drop call, you know, analysis or something mm -hmm. like that, it's a, it's a great tool uh, for doing that. This is one of the ones where Steve Jobs actually called us at the FCC and told us mm. how much he liked that app because it, uh, it uh, helped to you know, kind of compare the carrier's uh, mm -hmm. capabilities in different areas. So it's a good, it was a good thing. Let me go to the other end of the bell curve. And by the way, it costs five digits. You know, okay, you about, save about money, 10 ROI, yeah, it's all good. Let me go to the other end of the bell curve. How much technology in there in the government is 1950s, 1960s? If I wanted to go see punch cards, could I find them? <laughs> if I wanted to see magnetic tape, could I find I it? I saw magnetic tape today uh, <laughs> here in Silicon Valley. I went to the U.S. Geological Survey, does all the earthquake monitoring. Mm. They had a, 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 a magnetic tape, one machine that d read the old 1970s magnetic tapes on earthquake data that they had, and they're, they're working through, like, taking all the tapes and digitizing them into modern formats, which was great to see. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't think the, the COBOL class I took in college would come in so handy <laughs> as it now does when talking to the Social Security Administration and others. There's still COBOL? Uh, there is still COBOL out there. It's amazing. And, wow. Uh, and, and so it, it exists. Uh, but, our, you know, our goal is to, is to, you know, do lots of things to drive innovation across government. And I think, I think the you know, taking and promoting a notion with Congress and others that we can't just ignore kind of the operating expense and only focus on kind of new delivery. We also need to go back and sort of have an effort to modernize the, uh, the percentage of stuff we do. Over 50%, slightly over 50% of, uh, of the federal spend is on operat operations and maintenance. Um, mm -hmm. It's not an apples to apples and the data is sort of soft because certain agencies, you know, do new development in their maintenance mm -hmm. context. and. Some do, uh, you know, maintenance in the in the kind of new development category as well. So it's not tagged and and all that. But I would say the general sense is that about 57 percent or so is uh, is um, is operations and maintenance. And I think we have an opportunity to one one optimize that a little bit. And I think data center consolidation and doing these efforts are is one way. Um, and then driving a different model into into looking at things like shared first policy or mm -hmm. the future first policy to drive kind of that more agile development will get us on a pace of innovation because a lot of times the getting over the hump of these existing systems is such a capital expense mm -hmm. that you can't justify it and so you need to break it down into pieces and kind of attack it from that angle and I think we have an opportunity to do that we're we're attempting to do that right now in the in the uh, there's a there's a very big uh, or there's actually a very disparate set of technologies that make up a federal acquisition Mm -hmm. uh, uh, systems, um, and we have an op we have an, uh, uh, an initiative going to actually consolidate those into a single system that's based on modular design, web services, cloud based, and all that. And and uh, and I think we'll will not only make life better for the agencies that use and do acquisition, and we'll promote our shared first, but also it will be easier for the uh, the vendor community to, mm -hmm. to kind of plug into and think about too. How siloed is the government information community? Does each agency live in its own world and have no sense of how the guys at defense or social security or anywhere else do it? And what can you do culturally to try and get people talking and sharing best practices? I'd say that's, that's one area in, in talking to, and I, I've gone around and met with all the major CIOs and I'm making it through all the, all the CIOs and been on the job two and a half months, is, is, uh, is that's an area that my predecessor and the kind of culture shift that the president brought on um, has really changed in the last two years. Um, 
We have something called the CIO Council mm -hmm. um, that, that meets on a very regular basis to sit down. It was one of the first meetings I had was with my fellow CIOs to talk about you know, the opportunities ahead of us and what we do. Uh, there is a best practices subcommittee that's got a got an you know, inside government uh, 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 set of uh, tools to share best practices. And then we also will do big events. Uh, the last one was actually really, really good where we call on the vendor community to come in. We get up in panel form and talk about our challenges and ask them to ask the vendor community to just generate white papers for us mm -hmm. that we have real world practical uh, uh, deliverables on how we can solve these problems. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, uh, we're looking to the private sector for advice on like vendor management, investment review, you know, technology implementations, mm -hmm. cybersecurity, lots of different things to, mm -hmm. to kind of pull from there. So. If you look at other countries, uh, governmental IT efforts, you've referenced global competitiveness as your closest equivalent to market yes. competition. Who do you see out there where you go, you know what, we can learn from them? Yeah, the two, the two big ones that I'm paying really close attention to right now is, uh, is Canada. Just went through an effort that they're launching this month. We'll, we'll see how the outcome is. Um, Canada just launched something called Shared Services Canada, where they took basically IT capabilities across their different federal agencies and put them into one agency. It's an 8,000 person agency that will basically run IT, line of business mm -hmm. like HR systems, financial management, payroll, things like that mm -hmm. in one singular agency. It's, a, it's an interesting experiment. Mm -hmm. I'm glad they're doing it so we can watch and mm -hmm. see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that, I think distributed actually is a good model too because it creates vibrancy in a way that, that, that a consolidated way, you know, consolidated mm -hmm. agency wouldn't. Um, mm -hmm. And I think our model creates vibrancy in our marketplace in, mm -hmm. in a way that we couldn't do that if we consolidated. And they're also one tenth the size generally on, Mm -hmm. people spend and all that stuff. And so it's, it's a little bit different from that perspective. So that's one I'm paying close attention mm -hmm. to to see how that goes. And um, I, I am on a, a I have regular uh, uh, calls and we actually do this, uh, this, uh, uh, this sort of telepresence like, like thing mm -hmm. with, uh, with uh, CIOs of other countries where I talk mm -hmm. to them about this. The other one's the UK mm -hmm. who's taking an approach kind of on my point around uh, citizen engagement, citizen mm -hmm. business engagement. The UK is taking all their websites mm -hmm. and consolidating them to two, a mm -hmm. citizen portal and a business portal. And I think that's an interesting notion um, to think about uh, in, in the federal government. It's definitely something I think we could aspire to and would really promote the outside looking in mentality versus the inside out mentality. And so I wanna see, I wanna get, kind of get best practices there. I think we have the opportunity to actually set up some commodity infrastructure and do some experiments in that area. The business, business USA stuff that I mentioned will be our first foray into that. Um, and then I wanna look at platform technologies that allow this. I don't know if a lot of you know, like the, the NFL uh, is one website. No matter mm -hmm. which team you go to, it's actually yeah. one, one website, just a different instance of that website based on where you are. And so there's sort of a no wrong door policy in the NFL too. If you have a favorite team, you may be able to find your way to a different team to look at something and, and things I like that. And I certainly find it with labor and commerce, that that's a division that made sense in 1920, but now you just want an economy portal. Right, and or small business know. administration and commerce and that intersection. And, totally. and you have, <laughs> as I mentioned, the seven different agencies that do exporting and how mm -hmm. does that play in? There's, there's mm -hmm. definitely an opportunity here, I think, to, to, we for too long have kind of, you know, relied on citizens to absorb that complexity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really not been an enabler versus an inhibitor to getting stuff done with government. Mm -hmm. I think we can drive some efficiency that we don't have today. I want to pick up on two more points you made and then open it up for questions because we've got a lot of people with um, points that are of interest to you and I want to give as many people as possible a chance. Great. But let me just uh, pick on two. Um, you'd mentioned you know, the government is a Blackberry shop and you were diplomatic about that. Mm -hmm. But if you wanted to hook up an iPhone, if you wanted to hook up an Android, could you do it? Or is that just totally off limits right now? Uh, there are agencies that are doing it. Depends on the agency, policy, the cyber aspects of it, uh, ensuring that the technology is there. Um, I, think the, I, I think we have a, a little way to go working with the industry on, on device evolution to meet government needs. Um, you know, there are ways to make that work. Um, I have a, the, the White House has a program right now where you can bring your own iPad in and run a Citrix client to get it to, to a virtualized desktop to get your email and all that sort of stuff. And, and that's a, because it, 
keeps all the data on the back end and I'm mm -hmm. subject to the Presidential Records Act and other things so I can't have local data on my own devices but uh, that's an example of one where where it's a, it's a nice innovation. USAID is actually doing a, a great program. Uh, they have a two device policy that basically says you can have a, you know, a laptop and a Blackberry or a, an iPad and some other device and things like that. So that's, that's actually cutting down on the number of things where they're enabling more. They've, they're standing up wireless in the buildings and mm -hmm. uh, in the non sort of secure areas. Um, and then VA is also piloting right now a great an iPad program at their hospitals for their doctors. Mm -hmm. So they're actually walking around using some of the medical infrastructure to, to, to do patient management and other things on iPads. So it exists across government, uh, but we don't have a mobile strategy. So I'm, I'm definitely, that's top of mind for me to, to work on a strategy that would get us scale efficiencies, uh, you know, call on the industry to drive uh, uh, device capabilities and uh, and start to solve some of these, some of the problems and meet the opportunities that we have on that on the mobile front. So I would ask you a year from now you'd have one. I hope so. Okay, I'll judge mm -hmm. me on that. <laughs> uh, I was intrigued by your point on security too, and I, I began to wonder. I mean, we we all know the case for security, and we all know what happens when the security department is so assertive about its case that we're locked out of the devices we thought we were able to use. Are you, in the, in the end, the usability advocate within this process? The the one person who says, but are we ever going to be able to use it if we put in all of that? And is that a role that you welcome? I think, you know, much like the private sector, it's about risk mitigation. You, mm -hmm. There's a certain line you draw on where, where do you, you know, where do you put the risk line on the versus the benefit line on this stuff? I mean, the, uh, you know, a lot of the issues we've seen with cyber in the world have been, you know, either, uh, you know, someone misplaced something or, Someone, you know, someone digitally got, you know, broke into a system, or you have an insider threat where some employee unknowingly, you know, sticks a USB drive that has some malware on it, or, or mm -hmm. something, or, um, or, or does something else bad within an organization that has access, you know, uh, to those things. I think that we have to have kind of a, a kind of a multi-factored approach to cybersecurity, but also one that leans to understanding, um, understanding the cyber capabilities. Um, you know, if, if, if we did everything to a cyber sense on our BlackBerry, I would be pulling out an RSA token and punching in a, you know, a, a, mm -hmm. a, a code. I'd maybe be sticking a card in the side of it to, you know, do multi-factor authentication mm -hmm. and things like that. There's, you know, thumbprint reader on it or something. Yeah. Like, it, you know, the ends, you know, the sky's the limit on the number of like, like ways you could secure these things. I think there's a, there's a balance that we have the ability to strike that balance between the way we use what kind of information is where, what's the value of the device if you were to say lose it, leave it somewhere. Um, you know, the ability on many of these new smart devices to wipe them remotely, yeah. mm -hmm. the ability to kind of, uh, you know, do a, a terminal client into the back end. So once you shut it off, it's, it's kind of worthless to you. All those things are encouraging on the ability to, to, mm -hmm. have, uh, to, to have great usage. Um, I think the broadband capabilities that are emerging in this country and, and I definitely worked on when I helped on the national broadband plan at the FCC mm -hmm. are such that we could, uh, we could get some stuff done there. Great. So we're able to start questions now for everyone. A uh, few house rules. Uh, I want to keep the questions as succinct as possible so that we've got a chance to hear full answers. If you're able to condense them to two or three sentences, that's terrific. You can tell me to condense my answers. But yeah. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't followed that rule yet. So. No, take, take as long as you want. Uh, and we'll start over here. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, Thank you. It's very interesting to hear the plans for opening up to business and commerce. Um, but I think it's important to look at the role of secrecy in government and what you can do to help that. because. To be honest, the Obama administration, for all its claims of being the Transparency Administration, has been a secret about the crucial policies that have, uh, that have rolled, been rolled out and been catastrophes, from the bailout to the health care plan, which was done in secret. Many of the policies totally in secret. So I'd like you to comment at least on the, on the, 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 the relative importance of the infrastructure of openness, which is absolutely important, mm -hmm. and the commitment to actual transparency uh, as, as opposed to secrecy because I don't Great. think Obama has come through on that. <laughs> Great, so, so 
we are, we're guided by a few things in this country. Uh, um, one is something I worked very closely with at the Federal Communications Commission was the, uh, was the way we create rules and laws um, uh, is guided by this thing called the Administrator Procedures Act, which basically calls on um, agencies to follow a certain process by which you create rules and you involve uh, you know, players in that and you get regulatory review happening. And, and one of, the, one of the, the, the kind of key tenets of it um, is this great line in the Administrative Procedures Act that talks about uh, uh, getting citizen feedback to enlighten the rule that you're creating. And um, I took that to, a, to kind of the most extreme at the FCC by doing a few things. One is I, we basically put forward a policy that any rule we were creating at the agency had to involve citizens in a way that, that we hadn't before. It, uh, the process when you go to that same entrance to the FCC and walk that same filing window is also the window in which you would file your, your legal comments on any proceeding in front of the agency. That process was a very lawyer-driven process. You had to understand docketing, you had to understand all these things to get involved in the rulemaking of this country that maybe affects all of us in this room who maybe can't afford a lawyer to go in and do that, that on our behalf. And so we, 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 I did, like many things that I do in life, took a crawl, walk, run kind of, kind of attitude to this. And that first was, was uh, we took uh, proceedings in front of the agency and we put blog posts up that had the proceedings in them. And any comments that any normal human on this, you know, in this country went up and commented on went into the official record and had to be considered in the, uh, in the process. Uh, we then moved to crowdsourcing platforms and started to do that at the FCC. We, we broke all records with the agency as far as number of citizens that came online and actually interacted. We had one proceeding that over, had over 300,000 people uh, interacting with it. Uh, unprecedented. It, it had always been, you know, you know, fewer than 1,000 and always lawyers that were always involved in this stuff. We had over 300,000 people with visibility and the ability to comment on that. Uh, then the third stage was really building this robust infrastructure uh, at the agency. So every proceeding that's up, everyone can go in, look at other people's comments, pile on those comments, provide those. And if you go to FCC.gov today, you'll see that infrastructure. Um, I actually made it so no matter where you go on the site, no matter how far you scroll down on a page, at, that always follows you at the top of the, the bar. So you always have that ability to comment on it. I think, you know, the administration and the president appointing me and hiring for me, me for this job was based in large part on my commitment in open government and the work I had done there. Um, you know, a lot of what I'll focus on in this job is going to bring open government uh, to IT spending and to implementation, and that's that's you know kind of the valuework of what I'm going to do. But the the future first initiative, democratizing data by making it schematized and available to everyone, and and building interfaces into stuff so people can mash up data and start to get real visibility into that. I think the work we're doing on the Recovery Act, uh, uh, the transparency we're applying on the spending and USA spending and all that um, is all spent out of efforts that we've done in the IT shop. And I think the, the, that, will, that will continue on and I very much have a commitment to driving a lot of those initiative forward, uh, initiatives forward. So. Terrific. Um, got another question back here. I really like your ideas, but I'm wondering to what extent you can influence the agencies that are very invested in protecting their information, like the NSA, the CIA, and the Pentagon. Uh, they're so in interested the question in is, uh, what influence would you have over the NSA, CIA, and other agencies that have a very protective view of their information? So I, uh, um, uh, I, uh, I oversee the IT spending of the federal government. Uh, um, which includes all the, uh, all the uh, non-civilian agencies, the Department of Defense, and, and all of that. Um, I think driving good behavior across all of these is important and making sure that we, that we uh, you know, take the data that is appropriate for putting out publicly and we get it out publicly, and I think that's a, that's a good thing. And anyway, we'll, we'll get there. Great. Next question. So now living in hyper-competitive Silicon Valley, um, I tell people my role is to make mistakes faster and cheaper than anybody else. <laughs> and as you noted earlier, the federal government tends to make mistakes slower and much more expensively. Yeah. And I know in particular the Marines are now fielding the Osprey aircraft after 25 years of development. 
how are you going to create a world, including your technology fellows, where it's okay to make a mistake, and the key element is to learn from those mistakes quickly and make mid-course corrections, and also to get good ideas to bubble up from the top as opposed to being dictated by some senior department administrator? Yep, that's, that's a great question and well put on the, uh, on the on make mistakes. I, I, uh, something I institute, instituted at Microsoft in, uh, in my time there, I had a bunch of young people that were joining my organization, and, and uh, I was part of the executive team running the server division as my last job. Uh, there and we had a, a bunch of MBAs and others who hadn't come from a culture of making mistakes. They, they, had, they had sort of A students, they wanted to sort of be a pleaser and to achieve what they were doing. Um, I actually created an infrastructure of, a, of a, a, a risk award where I would actually award people in an all hands meeting in front of hundreds of their peers for failing. And we would actually give, uh, you know, we'd, we'd talk about those things as a, as a key thing. I would give them financial bonuses for literally failing on, on things because they had pushed the envelope and, and stretched. I think instilling that culture, getting, you know, kind of the, the combination of the entrepreneur and resident, because I bet many of you, if you want to come work in government and be an entrepreneur in residence, have been through a, a, a risk, uh, a risk-based approach where you failed and learned and scaled. Taking that person to mentor these, these younger people in the, in the technology, uh, presidential technology fellows program will be something that I think will, will drive. And I think the modularity and the size of these deliverables will also breed a, a phenomenon where we can go in and, and vet those and look at, um, a look at these things. The, one of the things we're, we're piloting in certain agencies that I, I didn't talk about, I talked about a little bit tonight, but not in this context, there's these investment review boards. These will be people that will actually look at the modularity and, and success failure and will be able to kind of judge those independently of the people delivering the project too. And so we'll get the, I think we'll get a nice ecosystem coming out of that. But it's a good thing to focus on. I'm glad you brought it up. Great. Next question. Yes. Uh, I guess I saw a couple of pieces missing from your future first vision. Yep. Um, one, I think we need to be also be driving innovation. So the question, are you linking into the technology roadmaps that are being developed at the National Academies, in the information technologies, the National Science Foundation driving research agendas to solve grand challenges that you're coming across in the government sector? I don't see any linkage there in the research agenda programs at NSF, NASA, DOD, particularly focused on ICT technologies. Secondly, uh, how is all this going to flow down to state and local governments? Are you going to, are you going to help them develop their IT systems more cheaply? Are you going to make available library modules in a way which is going to be easier for them to adopt as well? So it's much broader effect, multiple, higher multiplier effects than just federal government. So the answer to your second question is yes. Uh, but, but working with uh, state and local, I, just last week I had a meeting with NACIO, the National Association of uh, state CIOs uh, talking about exactly this, the future first strategy and how do we XML and, and, and web service the things we do in a way that, that applies to interfaces into state and local technologies. I think that's essential to our success. One, for the federal dollars that flow into state and local, um, and two is the, the viability of, of, the, of the spend at the state and local level. Um, we, uh, I'd, I'd also encourage the shared first strategy. If you look at like Medicare processing and things like that, we tend to set up one system and then the state, state and locals repeat it 50 times instead of looking at like regional solutions and things where we can actually share across those. And so I'm going I'm to encourage that same shared first mentality because we, we just, we have a necessity to do it for fiscal reasons and I think the technology, if you couple it with the other one. Uh, on the fundamental research and kind of focusing on, on all of that, um, I partner very closely with the Office of Science and Technology po uh, Policy at the White House, OSTP. Uh, we have very regular meetings and these conversations are definitely coming up on how do we drive the next wave. I'm also working a lot with NIST, the National Institute for Standards, um, to, to uh, look at things like evolving cloud architectures. Uh, uh, Pat Gallagher, the head of NIST, was the first meeting I had to talk about Future First. Uh, to say, like, give us the best thinking on cyber implications, XML, web services, like, what's the there there as far as what we can define and then what we can go out and drive at the grant process, the university level and others to, to do that. Um, uh, it's, not a, it's not a coincidence I'm, I'm standing in part giving my first speech, kind of on my belief that 
part of this uh, is is uh, is what's going to enable this next wave. And the, as I mentioned in my my you know first sentence, I think about the president's uh, State of the Union address, he believes it too. So, unfortunately. Great. Next question. Hi. Um, do you have any plans for um, the, the Department of Education, um, prisons, healthcare, um, Department of Energy? Those initiatives that kind of drive uh, America. I mean, education, I think, is very important. But it is an important uh, one, yes. I mean, you can't live without the earth if you can't live, things like that, and healthcare. Yeah, I think that the, the key there on those fronts is, from my perspective, because of what I influence and what I do, is, is really r grounded in the do more with less. It's about, it's about finding efficiencies. Um, in in uh, in certain places, uh, culling out IT spend, culling out that other things, so money that we save can be applied to mission, and that's the important thing. You know, a great example. I was at where I saw the tape drive today. I was at the U.S. Geological Survey uh, uh, in Menlo Park. They have this amazing facility. They they sensors up and down the coast. You know, sensing all the earthquake equipment. They have a, a little blue box uh, in there that, that I saw on the floor, and the. And the blue box is this, is this self-contained system that they, they put in homes in the Bay Area and some elsewhere in, in, the, in the country. They have this little metal plate. They, bolt, they level and bolt to like the understructure of your house and they put this blue box in that's you know, about, kind of about the size of a shoe box that has a wireless antenna and they plug it into an outlet. And what this box does is, is does local sensing of building impact for in, in the case of a seismic event, so if an earthquake's happening, they, they will sense, and this, this thing will use your Wi-Fi connection in your house to actually send data back because they, have, they tend to have really good sensors up on mountaintops and stuff, but not in the kind of seeing what's happening in certain building structures and certain other things. Uh, they put out a call to the public and asked the public, how many of you want one of these boxes? They over five, and nobody knows about this, and they had over 5,000 people come back and say, I want one of those blue boxes. I want to give the government data you know, in, in my house when a seismic event happens. I want this box to link up and send you the data. Uh, they can only afford about 200 of these boxes. Um, a couple of them are, um, we just had an had a earthquake in, in D.C. about a month ago, and and I was in the White House and that thing was rocking. <laughs> it was kind of scary. Uh, and they, they've sent a, sent a few of these boxes over there. We've got one in the National Cathedral and in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the Washington Monument and things like that. Uh, and when I was meeting with them and seeing their data center and seeing the seismic, seismic equipment and things in there, and they were talking about their infrastructure data center. They have more than one data center at the Menlo Park. Talking about their infrastructure data center and this and that. I was just looking at the cooling in that room in one of the infrastructure data centers and said, you know, if you consolidate this data center and you go to a cloud provider that's sitting next to a hydroelectric dam somewhere else in the country, how many blue boxes will that yield? You know, that suddenly became a conversation to, for us at the mission level to have a common currency by which we'll measure the savings we drive. It's not about just closing data centers for the sake of closing data centers. It's closing data centers so we create a phenomenon to fund other things. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I think they will take a more aggressive approach to close their data center because it'll yield more blue boxes and they'll, they'll get, I mean, the seismic engineers out there get very excited about data. And they're the only people I meet that are really excited about earthquakes, which is kind of scary. But <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Steve, you're in Silicon Valley. What Silicon Valley cares about the most is entrepreneurship. Uh, to what extent what you are doing has interfaces with the SBA and efforts to drive small business in America? Well, I think that um, I, part of my job at Microsoft was also running part of the small business uh, division there. And so I got, I got sort of a unique view into looking at entrepreneurial small businesses that were embracing technology to do new things. Um, and uh, and I was, I'm, I'm very encouraged to take that knowledge to the, the federal uh, landscape and, and drive it there. Um, I was on a call yesterday with Karen Mills from here. Uh, the, she's the, the head of the Small Business Administration talking about these topics and how do we drive innovation in government. I think the part of the introduction of, of the Future First initiative, breaking things down into small components, will open up uh, an opportunity for a myriad of, of vendors and hopefully create some, some uh, phenomenon around the way we build solutions. Um, I built the, F once we had done the web services work, uh, I built the FCC website with a minority-owned small business 
uh, for, for a much lower cost than what I was seeing the rest of the government do uh, to develop that. And it, it was a way that they're, they're now no longer an, what's called an 8A because my project grew them out of that size. Uh, they were able to hire and, and get new people on board to drive that. And so, and so I, I want to create that phenomenon across the, the broader uh, footprint. And I think we can, we can do it by changing the way we invest, rotating entrepreneurs in, creating a new spirit of the way you build. I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't even know how to engage with the government. And part of Business USA will be, will be also an on-ramp to understand how do you actually get uh, to serve the government as a customer and, uh, and get that uh, information up there. Yeah. Great. Next question. You know, uh, what, what you're proposing to do is exciting and it's necessary, but part of um, what you've got to do with Tiger Teams and, and entrepreneurs and residents is what we, we would call in the private sector business transformation. So to what extent will your agency be able to say, oh, well, we found duplication. We, there are better ways for us to integrate, uh, let's say, um, health services by combining you know, CDC and CMS and FDA and so forth into a ecosystem regardless of what agency they report to? Are you going to have the freedom to go to Congress and say your 1933 regulation is costing $3 billion a year? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, I will have lots of those conversations. Those are the hardest ones to change are the ones that are tied to law, as you probably know from our little conversation we had over here. But I think we have, we have an opportunity to, to have those conversations largely because of cybersecurity, fiscal pressure, people expecting more from their government. Now, on the, on the you know, rooting out duplication and thinking about that, we have, it, it, it needs a multi-prong approach, and I'm approaching it in a multi-prong way. One is shared first, the thing I announced today, uh, which is about taking a tack that when you go do something, if you're going to go build something, I expect that you look to see if there's a service out there that does it. You know, the federal government's got down to four payroll providers, which is probably pretty innovative for the U.S. federal government. We only have four right now. Um, you know, it'd be unthinkable in a private sector company to have more than one payroll system and things like that. And so, so looking for duplication and opportunity, shared first will help us there uh, on procurement, on systems, on other things, um, and drive that. So procurement's one of those. The other one's budget. You know, getting the budget examiners, the people in, 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 uh, in the appropriations committees and others to take a hard look at duplication. Um, I had all the appropriators uh, at a big meeting with all the appropriators a couple weeks ago, and I said, I'm on your team. If you see duplication, if you see those things, invite me in to sit on your side of the table, not the other side, and I will call, I will call uh, you know, foul on, on these agencies that are maybe doing duplication in the way that we need to drive it. Uh, um, I think there's a real opportunity you know, in, the, in the Future First initiative to, to, one, take systems that are small and modular today that should be commodity and move those to big monolithic systems. You know, USDA moving 21 email systems to one email system, massive scale benefits out of that. And I think we have an opportunity to take big monolithic failed projects and break them down into their small components. And I think that, that motion needs to happen. I think we do just the opposite today, which is everybody stands up core stuff independently and, and, and drives that direction. And then we, we, still fund, we still attempt to fund these big monolithic projects and we need to flip those. I think there's a great business for anyone. I'm, I'm giving you free advice here. Uh, do you want to create a, uh, a, 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 the front plate of a server with blinking lights on it but no hardware behind it? I think you, you know, I, that I can give to people and they can look at it and say, there are my servers blinking over there. That would be a good, and then we just virtualize and put it all somewhere in the cloud. It'd be a really good business. <laughs> it's fire. Yes, next question. So you mentioned the, uh, the Lean Startup Infestation, which is uh, Lean Startup is a cultural mindset that is probably fundamentally different from the bureaucratic government mindset of you know, the organizations you work with. What are some of the different ways that you plan on driving this cultural change into these organizations? I think you know, it's about, to me it's about, it, it's, it's about sort of three things. One is, one is people, and I talked about the presidential technology fellows bringing a new crop of people in, the entrepreneurs and residents. You know, in calling on people. You know, I left a, a, a career in the private sector to go to government, um, and I was very used to a pace of innovation that wasn't um, as obvious when I joined the administration. This president expects it, I mean, as you saw in the 
uh, on the 2008 election and the kind of stuff they drive, you know, and the, and the pace of the White House is definitely that way as I, as I now live in that world. But at the agency level, it wasn't happening at that pace when I arrived in early 2009. Um, and so inspiring that kind of through the people injection, I think, is one. Another one is, in, is uh, getting incentives, you know, getting people kind of to line up behind, you're going to deliver in this way. And the, the, the biggest incentive level le uh, lever in the government is budget and, and kind of controlling budget, spending on things, funding things and behaviors that you want to see. And luckily in my job, as part of my job being uh, in the Office of Management and Budget for the President, um, I, I can help on that front. And then the third is inspiration, getting people showing the best cases, showing examples of where this is working well, talking about the phenomenons that can happen uh, by coming out of it and sort of setting that direction. When I said, you know, I have to strike that balance between sort of inspiring and pushing, I think that's where this, this comes to bear on setting great metrics, kind of pushing people along to get there, but also inspiring them so they lead their own way there is, is part of it as well. It's, it's not an easy challenge because culture is the hardest thing to overcome in any organization and, and managing that change is, is tough. But I think the, the uh, you know, all the phenomena I talked about before, fiscal and, and cyber and, and, uh, and kind of the expectation level is, uh, is really tough uh, to manage. And so, we, you know, that will force a set of behaviors that we don't have today, and I think we can get there from a, from a good perspective. So. Great. Next Hi, uh, good evening. Patrick Planner from Support Space. I was curious, you mentioned something called share first and future first. I was thinking immediately, what about security first? And I was wondering, what is the balance you put between sharing more and securing the data at the same time? And there are extremely WikiLeaks that I'm sure that you're busy with still today. And when you think about sharing more data, I mean, the old way was just don't be connected. Build multiple email systems that nobody can talk to each other. And now you have, you are inheriting this system. And now you want to increase to new cloud technology, which is great. But do you think that the security will actually delay this project? Or do you find already some ways to use new technologies that could provide transparency while still keeping a necessary level of security? I think, I think we need to, um, you know, to me it's not security first, it's security everywhere. And that security needs to be part of every consideration we make. But as I mentioned before, it's, it's a false trade-off to make the innovation versus security uh, uh, choice, that those things have to be balanced. And oftentimes what I've seen in the federal government is that people will use security as just an excuse of not having to move off of what they're doing or some direction or investment they've made. And so I, I think that the real opportunity exists in the ability to kind of that intersection, to make, to make us more secure by innovating and by figuring out. Now, some of that's going to require, you know, evolution of the way we do things now. Um, you know, if we just, if you just take the mindset of the current data center and you sort of pick it up and put it in the cloud, and, but don't reorient the way you think about security or data or all that, I think you're, I think we miss an opportunity to do it. You know, we're launching this thing um, called uh, FedRAMP, which is a way of procuring the cloud where we, uh, we don't have every agency go through and do a separate procurement for cloud services, that we go in as, a gover as one government and do pre-authorize a bunch of providers. Um, and we streamline that, and it's just an open thing where, where providers can come forward. We're going to start kind of at the commodity side, email providers, people that have done that, because it's going to take us a while to work through this, all the, all the procurements. But a big component, and I think the secret sauce of FedRAMP, is, is that one, it's going to be, once we get through the pipeline of getting enough vendors in place, it's going to be required that acquiring cloud, you go through FedRAMP, and that coupled with the cloud first policy will be a good thing. And the second is that we've worked with NIST, um, the National Institute for Standards, to create an infrastructure for continuous monitoring. Uh, so the Department of Homeland Security will monitor now the cyber footprint and you know, intrusion, de intrusion detection, all this stuff across our entire cloud landscape. And the vendors who sign up for FedRAMP have to adhere to this continuous monitoring system. And so I think it's, that's an area where moving to moving to cloud, sh making the shift, innovating in this way can actually lead to a more secure uh, infrastructure. Sounds great. Next question. Hi. Um, one of the um, aspects of, of um, cutting costs in these massive monolithic projects that you see that continue to fail in every level of government is, is um, contractors. A lot of the times it's 
it seems to be contractors who are providing the service, like the FBI, for example. They have, you probably know, they have, for a long time, they didn't even have email, and they've, they've, they, they're always bashed on Capitol Hill um, for having systems that are failing, and it's, the services are being provided by contractors. So um, I was wondering if you're going to be changing, how are you going to address that? Are you going to um, try and change, make contractors more accountable? Yes. So one of the things we're, uh, we're piloting right now, and I've, I've, uh, we're, part of my trip out here is actually talking to some private sector companies who do this well, is uh, vendor management organizations. It's something that the private sector does well, but we do not do well in the federal government, where we have a central body that has oversight across kind of the investment review and vendor management. So any vendor that comes in to deal with the government, we have a more rigorous process to, to check on their ability to deliver or ability to do other things. Now, there's a, there's a phenomenon that I think Future First will help on too, which is, is these big projects that run out multiple years. There is, there is uh, there's a phrase in the, you know, in, in the ether out there that, that, that is, uh, there's margin in the mystery. And that if you can create mystery in this big, in this big, uh, in these big monolithic projects, not uh, there's there's margin available there. And part of that might be just be time delays. It might be putting more people on things. It might be that requirements change. It could be that that funding levels change. And all of that stuff creates kind of confusion at at the level of execution that I think doesn't yield the best results for the federal government. And so, and so the combination of investment review boards, vendor management offices. Uh, and I think agile, smaller, componentized development will give us more point of execution visibility into what we can do to get our arms around kind of managing that expectation um, as, a, as a whole of government, I think. Yeah. Great. We're down to our last question. We have to over here. Hi, Steve. Um, Hi. I was interested in your thoughts on open data formats, open APIs, open architectures versus open source. Uh, it seems like many agencies today have a bias to, to build these systems versus buy, com uh, buy commercial solutions, uh, considering these commercial solutions to be proprietary if they're not open source. Uh, what would your message be to these agencies that kind of have that particular mindset and are so concerned with got solutions and, and open source? It looks like you're reading a question I maybe texted you earlier or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, just on full disclosure. Uh, uh, um, it, uh, uh, so open data, op open, the uh, future first speaks to this to some degree on, on the ability to do this. I think the, the beauty of government data is when government data is live and you can create programmatic access to that data. I think if I look at an effort like data.gov, which is a great, a really good first effort for kind of getting, creating a center of gravity around government data. We have over 400,000 data sets up on data.gov. Um, that, the evolution of data.gov will see one where in a future first world, we have a, a repository of one schema for the data across the government, and two is uh, like an API key manager, the ability to have one programmatic center of gravity where you can go and then get access to government data uh, programmatically to build kind of an app phenomenon across government. So that's, I'll be pushing on that front to create kind of the, 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 the democratization of data through these mechanisms, uh, kind of on the policy side and then on the implementation side on data.gov. Um, uh, but the, the, the steps in the, that we've taken on data is the, over the right ones because agencies weren't ready for the XMLing and all that stuff. And so, we'll, we'll, uh, but I, I truly believe we'll get there. Uh, on, on open source and the use of open source, I think, you know, like I said before, I, I don't procure things. I've, you know, I, I, I've actually submitted Drupal uh, modules back to the community, I've done a bunch of stuff on, on that front. Uh, my take at the agency level is very similar to my take at the at the federal level, I guess the all up level, and that is, is we need to pick the right tool for the right job. You know, if it meets the requirements between what the mission of the agency is and the and the technology that's available to answer it, we should seize on that. You know, open source is a great alternative, as is paid software, and we want a vibrant ecosystem uh, in this country that we foster to to, to drive kind of innovation wherever it lives um, across kind of paid or non-paid uh, software. I think you could, uh, uh, um, you know, kind of kind of have really good things happen if you create that vibrancy and, uh, and drive it. So I'm a fan of doing all of it. Great. Well, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.
George, thank you very much for delivering this rich and diverse conversation for us this evening. And also um, want to thank our partners, Tech America, and especially Park for opening their doors to us today. Thank you, Steve and TechNet. Um, as a symbol of our thanks, we have a very special Churchill Club t-shirt for you. Please wear that in good health. And you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you for coming and have a wonderful evening.